Good afternoon and welcome to the Glendale Water and Power Commission on Monday, November 2nd, 2009. Sheila, may we have roll call, please? Commissioner Chan. Present. Commissioner Abrahamian. Present. Commissioner Miller. Present. Commissioner Yao. Present. Next item, please. Consider minutes of the October 5th, 2009 meeting. Do I have a motion to consider the minutes? Um, I'll make a motion that the minutes be accepted as drafted. I second. So do we need to take roll two for that approval in the minutes? Yes. Yes. We have roll call, please. Commissioner Chan. Present. Commissioner Ibrahimian. Yes. Commissioner Miller. Yes. Commissioner Yao. Yes. Next item, please. Uh, item three, reports. 3A, Glenn Steiger, Steiger, General Manager. Report number one, AMWA Gold Award. Report number two, Smart Grid Grant. Report number three, Strategic Plan Update. Members of the GWP Commission, uh, today I'd like to go over uh, three different uh, items. And the first item, I'm very, very pleased to announce that uh, GWP was the recipient of the Association of Metropolitan Water Agencies of their Gold Award for Exceptional Utility Performance. Uh, this is a national award, quite prestigious. Uh, you know, we were quite proud to have received it. We received this award at their annual meeting uh, last week in Tampa, Florida. And this is the award itself. Hard to see. But I'll show it to you. It's a, it really is a very nice award. But I, I think what it stands for, of course, is the more important thing. And it stands for really five areas that we were cited for and won the award for. Number one, a proactive and systematic approach to water quality. Number two, an open and thorough assessment of our business practices. Number three, a measurement of employee and plant performance. Number four, financial integrity. And number five, comprehensive maintenance of our system components. And of course, there are many, many subsets of those uh, major categories. But uh, we are very, very proud and pleased to have been uh, chosen as this year's recipient of the Gold Award. Number two, uh, the second item is uh, the Smart Grid uh, Award of DOE stimulus funds. Uh, again, I'm very, very pleased uh, to announce that GWP was one of only 33 municipal systems throughout the country to have been chosen uh, to receive uh, DOE stimulus funds up to $20 million. And what, to, what this means to GWP is that we will be able to receive up to $20 million towards our smart grid project, uh, which we've announced uh, a number of months ago and have actually started uh, in earnest here. And we expect to finish the first phase of our smart grid project within the next two years. We will match these funds. Uh, this, these funds, of course, will help us to accelerate the implementation of the project. Uh, we still have to negotiate the final number, and that's why I say it's up to $20 million. It may not be exactly $20 million, but we're fairly uh, com comfortable with the fact that it will be close to that. Uh, in any case, we are very, very pleased, and it's a testament to both the uh, this, our GWP staff, who worked tirelessly to put this project together along with the application for the funding, and to the soundness of the project itself. Uh, we think it speaks volumes. We're pleased and uh, very, very proud to have been chosen as a recipient. Before we move on, I, I would like to commend you and staff for uh, receiving both the award and the grant as we face many challenges with uh, the environmental issues and infrastructure issues. It's great to see that we're making so big of a headway toward that path. So, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'll add my congratulations. I'm sure everybody here in the commission feels the same way. Uh, and on the uh, Smart Grid grant, um, you had actually made some progress, I think, in implementation of it prior to getting the award. Am I correct in that? That is correct. And we had conducted a pilot on that, too, hadn't we? Uh, we will be conducting the okay. pilot, yes. All right. Okay. Well, congratulations. I know it was a lot of work, and it's a fantastic achievement. Thank you. 
Um, congratulations from me also. I, I just had a quick question. Uh, what is the total capital cost of the smart grid uh, estimated at this point in time? The, the smart grid uh, phase one, and I'll, I'll use that generally, which is the part that we're working on now, includes two major pieces. One is what we call AMI, and, and essentially what the AMI component is, is the change out of all of our meters, both electric and water, uh, to smart meters. In other words, two-way automated metering uh, that allows real-time data and so on. The second part of that phase is the meter data management system, which essentially is the, the software and hardware platform that ties not only the metering together, but all of the other applications that go along with smart grid. So that's the phase that we're in right now. That's about a two-year phase, and that's about a $35 million expenditure. Thank you. And Mr. Steiker, I just want to also add my congratulations to you and the staff of GWP for a job well done. And, and we're all in the energy industry, and we realize how important it is to solicit these type of grants and how great an accomplishment that is. So I really admire the fact that Glendale is one of the few municipalities in the whole country to achieve this grant. So a heartfelt congratulations to you and the staff. Thank you. And, um, and we've also been asked by the uh, American Public Power Association to present uh, at their conference in December an overview of our, our specific smart grid project to uh, the other public power utilities in the country uh, as an example of um, how to do it. So we're very pleased. Uh, the final issue today that I'd like to talk about is to give you a very brief update on our strategic plan uh, as, uh, as we have committed to do each quarter. We are producing a scoreboard. Uh, we have just updated the scoreboard. It will be uh, posted on our website later this week. Um, I'm not going to go over every piece of it. What I just want to do is point out a few highlights of where we are. I think the, uh, the scoreboard itself is self-explanatory in, in terms of uh, we're either ahead of schedule, on schedule, or behind. And as you can see, most of the areas are on schedule. We have a few that are uh, ahead. Uh, one of those I'll point out is to uh, underwater supply, the production of... Uh, 3,856 acre-feet from the Verdugo Basin. Uh, we are ahead uh, in that area for uh, two reasons, because we're reconditioning an existing well, and we are uh, moving ahead with the, uh, uh, the construction of a new well in the Montrose area. So those two are, uh, that particular area is ahead of schedule. Uh, under power supply, we, uh, we continue to, to be one of the leaders in the state of California in energy efficiency and energy conservation. We continue to be in the top three, uh, in most cases the top, in terms of our uh, efforts there. So uh, we, we've shown that we're on schedule. We're probably a bit of he ahead of schedule. Uh, in terms of the uh, issue of getting our efficiency at Grayson to less than 10,000 BTU heat rate, next month... Uh, we are planning to give you an update on our integrated resource uh, uh, project. As, as we've talked about, uh, we now have the initial results, and hopefully we'll be able to give you a much more detailed discussion next month as to what that means in terms of what we are looking to do in terms of power supply over the next 10 to 20 years. Uh, so we are clearly on schedule for that, and I'm very pleased with the way this is turning out. There's a number of very, very uh, innovative thoughts in the, uh, in the, the uh, study. We uh, achieving an energy, a balanced energy portfolio. We are currently at 23% uh, renewable, well ahead of our own self-imposed uh, uh, renewable portfolio standard, and certainly ahead of the state's mandate at this point in time. Uh, again, very pleased about that. Uh, you'll hear a little bit more, as you always do, later on about uh, our uh, electric reliability, so I won't go into that. In terms of reducing system losses on the electric side to less than 10%. Uh, we have implemented a much more aggressive theft of service section uh, and uh, initiative here at GWP to identify theft of service, to understand what it means, and to hopefully have our customers be much more cognizant uh, in, that, in that area. We're making great progress there. Under power infrastructure, uh, we have started, as we've uh, brought to you in the last few months, uh, the, uh, the reconstruction of the Glorietta substation. 
which goes to a number of these issues in terms of uh, upgrading both our transmission level voltage and our distribution level voltage to a more consistent level uh, within Glendale and this is a major step forward so we're on schedule with that. In some of the areas where we're falling a little bit shy, uh, one of them is the area of a, in the workforce category, of having less than a 5% vacancy rate. Uh, we still have not achieved that, but we are getting a little bit closer. But because we've not achieved that, we're, we're showing that we're behind schedule, and we are. Um, we've also committed to zero preventable vehicle accidents, and we unfortunately don't have that, so we're behind schedule there also. Excuse me. Yes. With the workforce, uh, what what is our current vacancy rate? It's about seven percent. Seven. So it's not it's not extremely uh, out of line, but we've committed uh, to less than five, and so mm -hmm. until we get there, we'll we'll show ourselves behind schedule. Are we having to delay or postpone projects as a result? We've not had to delay projects. No, okay. we we have uh, on our own. Uh, volition, not related to workforce, but more related to costs, uh, extended some of our projects, but it's not a uh, workforce issue. issue. Okay, thank you. Under systems, uh, we're actually ahead of schedule. We show being on schedule in terms of the achieving 100% AMI meter saturation. Uh, as I mentioned, that's really a two-year project. Uh, at this point, we are looking at somewhat less than two years to achieve that. And then under legislation and regulation, uh, there's, there's a couple of areas we're actually ahead of schedule, and one is establishing continuing ongoing relationships with state, federal legislators and regu regulators. Uh, you'll hear an update on uh, our legislative initiatives and our, uh, our, our thought processes in that area a little later, but we are ahead there. We've done very, very well. We've, we've stepped up uh, our involvement dramatically in the last six months. Uh, and then finally, to provide quarterly reports on compliance strategies, relationships, and ma major activities, we are doing that now uh, in the form of our quarterly report. And I think uh, you got a copy of that at the last meeting. You'll get uh, another uh, quarterly report based on this particular scoreboard uh, next month. So, uh, so we're making great strides in those areas. I have another question. Sure. Um, under workforce. Uh, we're falling behind uh, with um, the, this uh, 7.5 item, have zero preventable vehicle accidents each year. Where are we now? How many do we have? This year we've had one. One. But one is, is still more than zero. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, Director Steiger, perhaps you could um, uh, mention what kind of obstacles, if any, you've been experiencing with respect to 7.3, which is to have a vacancy rate below 5 percent? There are a number of uh, issues. Uh, one, one is a workforce issue, which we have, again, made strides to correct in terms of having the trained and qualified uh, labor available to us. That's one area. Another area is self-imposed. We have self-imposed a, a bit of a slowdown in filling vacancies uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, number one, because of the economy itself, we've uh, decided to leave some of these positions open. Number two, because in looking at what our needs are, we're reevaluating whether or not to uh, to shift certain job classifications to new classifications. A good example would be in the area of AMI, where we now have a new set of requirements for labor that we didn't have a year ago or even six months ago. So uh, we're looking at what that, at what that means. Uh, and then uh, finally, we've, we've agreed to keep some of our positions open uh, in order to potentially, if need be, accommodate uh, employees from other parts of the city who need to find other, uh, you know, similar jobs within GWP. So there's a number of, of reasons we've done that. Much of it is self-imposed. Um, with respect to your first issue, uh, which is having labor available, we had talked, I know some over the years there's been discussion about setting up liaisons with junior colleges and other groups like that to 
uh, work on things like certification for power and water, and has that been useful in terms of uh, overcoming that particular obstacle? To, to the extreme, yes. We've, uh, I, I think you're, you're uh, aware of the fact that we set up uh, a formal agreement yeah. with Glendale Community College, and we've now established the Power Academy, yes. which we host uh, at the GWP location uh, down, at, down at our yard. Uh, that has been overwhelmingly successful in terms of the interest in uh, students wanting to become part of it. Uh, so we see that as a, a new ongoing pipeline for qualified uh, labor and technical employees within GWP. So yes, that's, we're moving along very well in that area. Might that be a model for other areas where labor might be deficient right now in the market for GWP's needs? Absolutely. In fact, we are talking with all of our uh, neighboring municipal systems in that, uh, on that very item. Excellent. Mr. Steiger, on the rates uh, category, uh, I think you mentioned this in the past also. How do we measure uh, to reduce the electrical rates to 35% below Southern California, Edison? In, in a number of ways. Okay, we have uh, two major issues that we've been working on for the last year now uh, in terms of issues that are creating uh, over-market expenditures for us in the area of power supply. Uh, we're making progress in both areas, and since uh, both of them now are uh, being litigated, I can't say a whole lot more than that, but I can say that I see a successful, a successful conclusion within the coming year in both of those areas, which will help to uh, lower or stabilize our rates. Uh, at the same time, we are cutting back on things like overtime uh, and other costs within our fixed costs, within our base rate, uh, so that we can stabilize what we have now. And the idea is to stabilize, uh, potentially reduce base rates to the extent that we can, and through our hedging, activities which we have accelerated greatly in the last six months uh, stabilize and reduce our purchase power and natural gas costs. So we're working on it uh, quite a bit. Thank you. Sure. And uh, I have a question too, Mr. Steiker. I'm interested in the profitable new business ventures yes. on System 8.5. What is that again? Can you uh, briefly describe what that is and how we're going to proceed with that? There's, there's a couple of areas. Uh, the, the, most, the one that's most obvious for right now is the area of uh, ex greatly expanding the use of our fiber system. Uh, we have a fiber system in place which is utilized currently in-house and by a couple of our larger customers. However, there is great potential to expand the use to other customers and uh, we're looking at that now in a much more aggressive fashion. So that's one that we, we are looking at currently. And the only reason that I put that behind schedule is because I, th I personally believe that we could do a better job of marketing it. So we're, we're going to now start to market that. On the other side of the coin, uh, there, are, there are potential business ventures that once the smart grid is put in place, so that's down the road, say, two to three years, we'll be able to develop other ventures that will utilize the technology that we've put in place. Uh, so they're not there yet, so they're, they're hard to talk about. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, one more one question. More. On uh, 2.4, I believe, uh, in the past, I think we were... Uh, there have been questions about what exactly a balanced energy portfolio is. And does that tie into the, uh, the hedging uh, mechanism? Perhaps you could elaborate. To a degree. It, it really means this. And to generalize, again, I'll generalize on how we view a balanced portfolio. Uh, a truly balanced portfolio would balance renewables, our own in-house generation, and outside contracts and real-time purchases. Uh, generally, if we wanted to be truly balanced, we would be about 33, 33, and 33 percent, depending upon the markets. Um, what we we're not at 33 percent uh, in any of those categories right now. We're skewed a bit mo to towards more long-term and real-time purchases. Uh, we are, however, uh, looking. What will we we will, in fact, increase our renewables to 33 percent. That's a given. And through our current study on what we're going to do at Grayson, that will determine exactly how much of our own in-house generation we will actually uh, rely on. Whether that's 33 percent or 25 percent remains to be seen, or 50 percent. could be that, that high. Uh, but 
that's where we are. A truly balanced would be 33, 33, 33. Probably we won't get there, uh, but there's there's good reason to to skew that a little bit. Thank you. Sure. And we have a request to speak for 3A. Um, I invite Mr. Herbert Milano, please. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Herbert Milano. Uh, 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 commissioners and, and Chair, I wanted to ask uh, if Mr. Steiger could uh, perhaps answer this question that I have with regard to the strategic plan. Does the strategic plan include any periodic or quarterly improvements with regard to the rate? I know that Mr. Ibrahim asked this in question, but I didn't hear an answer. Uh, today, uh, I pay in the city of LA, on my property in LA, I pay 11, 12.3 cents per kilowatt hour. My property in Glendale, I pay 15.9 cents per kilowatt hour. That's excluding taxes and everything else. We raise it up to 24 cents per kilowatt hour. Um, and so that's the first question. What are we doing on a quarterly basis to try to achieve that? And uh, second, is the public benefit need part of that assessment? Most of the quality, uh, I'm sorry, the strategic plan issues that you bring up here are pretty much internal as to how well you're, you're running the, the organization. I think you're doing a great job of that. But the other side of it, the strategic plan as it refers to the public, how is that being addressed specifically with regard to the public benefit and identifying how we're going to uh, gauge or evaluate progress towards achieving a sense of uh, or reducing the number of people who are in dire need of, uh, of a break? Thanks. Uh, I'll, I'll just expand a little bit on the uh, uh, Mr. Milano's first question. Uh, I, I answered generally what we're doing to give uh, uh, a, a quarterly breakdown on in terms of specific numbers. We can do that. Uh, it's more of a continuum because uh, the stabilization of our rates is based on a number of things, and I mentioned two of them. Two of the major issues right now are being litigated, so uh, it would be hard to give a specific dollar figure or number on a quarterly basis, but I can tell you that uh, all the issues that are in this, in fact, if you go into the true strategic plan, not just the scoreboard, you'll see how it's broken down, and we do report on the individual issues on a quarterly basis um, in the plan itself. Not through the scoreboard, though. That is true. But we don't have a specific uh, metric, for example, on a quarterly basis that would allow us to say this quarter we reduced rates by 3.5%, if, if that's what you're, you're thinking. Uh, generally, we, we are, it's a continuum, and we are starting to have a, uh, the, the gap that we're looking for, as we mentioned, because we're, we're looking to reduce between, you know, a 35% reduction between ourselves and our major competition, which uh, admittedly is, is a, f a stretch. Uh, but we are starting to see that gap uh, open up as we expected. Uh, we could probably have some kind of metric. I don't know how meaningful it would be on a quarterly basis, but we probably could. But the strategic plan itself does have specific uh, pieces under that category that are much, much less broad than what we have here. Mr. Steiger, the goal is to to get to that 35 percent by December of was it 2012? 2014. 2014 correct. in the strategic plan. That is correct. Right. Yes. Is it possible to provide an estimate as to any reduction we have had from our, uh, let's say, uh, what the rate was at the time that we started the strategic plan? We can. We can. We can do a. a, a "Quote unquote gap analysis to show that gap. Yes, that we can do that. And then the, um, the to answer the second question, uh, we actually do have a number of metrics that we use on the customer side for public benefit. Uh, as you know, we we uh, have a an ongoing public benefit uh, program that is specific towards customers. It relates back to the fact that we are always number one or number two in uh, conservation and energy efficiency. Uh, we have a number of, of uh, incentive programs. Our solar program is still one of the best in the state. Uh, we still provide, I believe it's four dollars per uh, kilowatt in terms of installed capacity and, and more and more utilities are starting to get away from, with that, from that. So we have a number of programs that we do measure and we have a whole separate section of public benefit, uh, again, that uh, we don't show here, but it's part of 
the overall strategic plan. But we can do that. We can publish that on a quarter. In fact, in our quarterly report, we will show those numbers. They will be there. Next item, please. Item 3B, water, report number one, water supply report, number two, water conservation update, number three, water recycling report, number four, backflow ordinance, and number five, Chevy Chase update. Good afternoon, uh, President Yao, commissioners, staff. I'm Pat Hayes, principal civil engineer, GWP Water Engineering. Thank you. You would have received uh, in your packet the water supply report for November, which has data through the end of September. And um, in that report, a couple of points to highlight. Um, number one, on the water conservation side, we continue on a uh, favorable track in that regard for the third consecutive month that is all of this fiscal year. We uh, are managing to achieve our goal and then some. The average for uh, reduction for September to the uh, 2006 year September was 18 percent. So we're in, in very favorable situation. That uh, means that as we continue to plot our trend line for any potential uh, adverse financial impacts vis-a-vis -vis, uh, fines from MWD for exceeding our demand, we're in very good shape in that regard and doesn't look like with the current trend, it's now starting to establish as a very strong trend. Uh, the first month, uh, just to repeat back from what we reported earlier, was 20 percent, then 16 percent, and then the last month, 18 percent. So it's a fairly consistent trend line. And uh, in the packet, you may have noticed on the last page, we've been now providing you with some uh, temperature and evapotranspiration information. And that's helpful because it's one thing to conserve when it's been cold weather and raining, it's another thing to conserve when it's been warm and, uh, and very dry. And the trend lines are indicating that even though it has been some periods of warmth, that we're still uh, conserving fairly well. Um, in all other regards, our consumption, our well production, and uh, our recycled use are pretty much normal for what we've seen this time of the year. Any questions about the water supply report? I just wanted to thank you and the members of the staff for achieving, uh, and actually the public really, for achieving the uh, water conservation goal. Thank you. I think the message is out and people are, uh, are grabbing hold of it uh, citywide. So whatever they're doing, please continue as customers to do what you're doing. It's, it's working. I'll move on to uh, item two, water conservation update. This refers to the ordinance which was passed back in June, uh, July of this year. We went back to council with uh, effectively, uh, euphemistically, a cleanup ordinance to take away a couple of elements that weren't quite working uh, the way they needed to be and weren't in fact necessary. And so that's been uh, passed by uh, the council and is now in the updated ordinance. Uh, for example, decorative fountains was one issue. We didn't see much in the way of uh, evaporation from those, so therefore it's no longer part of it. I think there's some other elements about uh, hand watering and trees and uh, root trees and the like, so generally that's uh, it seems to have been well accepted by the public, meeting that what they had been requesting as adjustments. I'd like to move on then to the water recycling report, and I have a slide presentation on that. So just to recall, a few months back we had given you a report on uh, the status of our water recycling system. And um, with the strategic plan, uh, that calls for 900 acre feet uh, additional supply being added to the system in the next five years. So with that in mind, we've proceeded forward with what that plan would look like and how we would fund that and what, what it would uh, do in the way of an ordinance change. And, uh, open that for your discussion when we're done. With, uh, if you need additional information, we'd be happy to come back to you on that. 
if you're satisfied, at some point we would go to the council with a similar presentation. So the outline of this presentation today, what's the current status, which I've already covered with you previously, so that'll be fairly brief, on the recycle system, the ordinance, and our situation with recycled. Purchased or MWD water rates current and projected. Proposed future expansion, what our approach is, what its cost will be. Potable versus recycled water cost, which is essentially the driver in all this. Proposed funding and ordinance changes uh, to to meet this objective, and then seeking your comment and, and input as to how to proceed. Uh, just to, to recap what you've seen previously, we have 21 miles of distribution system, six pump stations, five storage tanks, and about 45 users. And the Glen, Glendale's recycled share of the Los Angeles uh, Glendale Water Reclamation Plant, 4,750 acre feet per year. We currently deliver about 1,600 acre feet with the present system. The cost of that infrastructure, largely built in the early 90s, was about $20 million. And that was paid for by a surcharge through the ordinance of eight cents per 100 cubic foot. Now that expired in 2006, and that's a key component of what's happened since then. Here's what the system generally looks like. You've got uh, essentially a Y-shaped system, and it was designed to go pick off the major potential users in the system as they were known in the early 1990s. And this shows the 45 major users of the system. The current situation with our ordinance is that it requires a new user, should they desire the service, to pay all costs for the extension. And due to the new conservation ordinance that we've had in effect for the last three months, and that recycled water is at a discount, uh, many have shown interest in recycled water even before this ordinance went into play, but few have, have proceeded. And I think that's really the bottom line, is that nobody has really decided this was worth their effort to proceed on on an individual customer basis. That presents some opportunity, I think, from the utility and its ability to finance through municipal bonds and whatnot to come at it from a different approach. <clears throat> Another disturbing trend is that uh, the purchased water costs are going up. This last year, uh, we went from $578 a, an acre foot to $701. That's our current rate. That was about a 20% increase. The coming fiscal year, MET does not pro uh, project any increase, but then the following year, another 20% increase. To try and normalize that, we've based this curve, its projection, on a 7% per year increase. So for the foreseeable future, we see the rates continuing to rise. This does not factor in a couple of key variables. One is the availability of water to start with, imported water from both the Colorado River and from the state water project. Uh, it doesn't factor in the restrictions that have been placed on our water supply uh, via uh, judicial issues and environmental issues about the Delta. So uh, we've just done a simple 7% increase per year here for, to keep the numbers straightforward. Um, sorry to interrupt. I have a question. Not at all. Uh, you mentioned earlier um, <clears throat> that few have proceeded even though they have shown interest. Um, knowing you know the uh, discount and also the new conservation ordinance, do you know what are some of the reasons why few have proceeded? Uh, a couple of examples. Uh, typically, what they're paying for is uh, an extension of the system, mainly pipeline, and at a, a rate of one hundred and fifty, one hundred sixty dollars a linear foot to build that pipeline. Mm -hmm. uh, when an individual user looks at their their current bill looks at the 25% discount that they would get and the amount of water they would save, their payback periods are several decades or longer. So consequently, it's not highly incentivized from the perspective of what they're paying for their water rates today. And in effect, it's cheaper to keep renting water from MWD rather than supplying mm -hmm. a, an investment in a a uh, local water supply, recycled water. So it's mainly cost. It's their perspective. Yes. Um, are we looking at things that we can do 
in Glendale in terms of making it more attractive, whether it's by using grant money or applying for grant money or um, another kind of funding. Are we looking at any possibilities in making it more attractive? There's a couple things we've done. For example, on the stimulus package, we did submit uh, for recycled water. Uh, on that particular one, I think we're way off the list in terms of any opportunity for that. They only funded about 5% of the projects that were submitted, uh, amongst many others. You know, it's just a, a lot of demand and very little supply. Uh, there, frankly, isn't much in the way of grants available. Most of our grant funding has gone to the Chrome 6 removal project, so... It's a, a pretty limited pot to to uh, attract any funding out of. Um, in terms of incentives, uh, right from the beginning, as far as I can tell, this 25% uh, deduction in your price was the incentive, and it remains to be the really the only incentive, other than the fact that we're producing a local water supply that we have control of, and that it goes to the long-term issues that importing water, the cost for that, are going to continue to rise. Mm -hmm. So uh, what I would get from what you're saying is to keep exploring what those yes, possibilities yeah, that would, would be. that would be great because we do have the amount of recycled water. Um, we just need to have more um, customers to participate. But the cost is high in building the lines. So The okay. issue is in, it's not in the having it available at the plant. It's getting it to mm -hmm. the Getting it customer. to the customer, yeah. Well, I think... Uh, as I play this forward, you might see some ideas that uh, that appeal to you. All right, thank you. Hopefully. So our expansion approach was uh, to look at all potential additional recycled water demand and uh, map that in our GIS system, and then um, build projects uh, costs around that estimate for each project and kind of lump them into uh, a set of projects that uh, would define a particular geographic location so that you get uh, some economy of scale for a, a group of projects done in a certain area. And then lastly, these uh, 14 sets of projects uh, were prioritized by the cost to deliver that water uh, on an acre foot per year basis. So here's what that uh, system looks like. Here's the system we currently have. And the first project that would come up here is Glendale Memorial Hospital. It has a cost of $137,000. It produces 15 acre feet a year. And it would cost about $595 an acre foot to deliver. Pretty attractive compared to the $701 we're paying for Metwater. But again, this is our most attractive project. And as you start going through these 14 groups of projects, uh, the next one up is the Disney area, Flower Street. It's about a $1.6 million project, which would produce 135 acre feet, uh, and it would be about $800 an acre foot. And you can see the, the little dots there. There's one, two, three, four, five projects uh, that would be associated with this group of projects in that area, and it would be just an extension of what we have in that area already built. South Glendale, uh, another 1,500 acre feet, but you can see the price is starting to go up. Now we're up to over $1,100 an acre foot. Uh, in the upper part of the system, up into Crescenta Valley, uh, a fairly major project, almost $7 million, but it produces 280 acre foot of demand. It would hit a number of parks, the 210 uh, corridor, and it would uh, have a cost of about $1,600 an acre foot and so on and so forth, you can start to see how these projects agglomerate. And finally, when you get near the end, you see that the, the price per acre foot is now almost $5,000. And now we're into the $10,000 range with that last one. Sorry. Here's the, the same list of projects in a table form. This is the cost of recycled water expansion. What we envision here on the left-hand column, you'll see year. So we, this was a five-year rollout. Year one, we'd have two projects, Glendale Memorial and Disney. Year two, uh, South Glendale, Upper Crescenta, and so on and so forth. The estimated cost for those projects in the next column, the amount of acre footage uh, they would, would produce, and the final column, the dollars per acre foot, if we were to amortize this over a 30-year uh, purchase. So this is kind of the equivalent of buying the house instead of renting the house. We're buying this capacity, and we have it locally produced. All told, this would more than double the size of the system. In blue at the bottom, 112,000 
linear feet is about 21 miles of system, and it would cost about $25 million to do that. But it achieves the 900 acre foot demand that we're looking to, to fill. So if we were to proceed with this project, how would we fund it? Well, the traditional way for a long-term investment is to get a mortgage, or in this case, sell a bond, uh, at 5% for 30 years. And we converted each of the projects into its cost per acre foot, from acre foot to actual 100 uh, cubic foot, which is our building unit. This table shows in the far right-hand column the same projects, but listed with its debt service and a cumulative debt service. As you go down this list, um, when you get to the bottom of all 14 groups of projects, you're looking at 12 cents of a surcharge that would be added. If we were to build these 14 projects in the next five years, it would cost $25 million. We'd sell bonds for that, and they'd be amortized with a 30-year surcharge of 12 cents per 100 cubic foot. So how does that work out? Uh, the third bullet, customers would subsidize the cost via a 12 cent surcharge. This is very similar to how the original system was funded. In fact, it's identical from what I can tell. Instead of being 8 cents, it's 12 cents. For a typical residential customer, uh, you recall in our rate increase uh, discussion two years ago, typical user is 2,200 cubic feet per month. With conservation, that typical user is now down to 20. And at 12 cents a 100 cubic foot, that means that they would be spending about $2.40 a month to fund for this, this program. These are the five-year rollouts of the projects and the cumulative cost up to that $25 million number, starting in uh, budget year 10-11. Uh, the recycled water delivery from this uh, uh, starts modestly with about 150 acre foot. The next year you're up to almost 500, and finally at the end you've added 900 acre foot of uh, local supply, replacing potable imported water. How does this break out in terms of our cost that I showed you, the cost curve for MET at 7% increase? Um, note the zero dollar line on the far left. As we build these projects, we're digging a bit of a hole because the price of MET water is slowly increasing. When that curve gets flat around 2023 or so, the cost of all those projects is the same as MET water would be costing at that time. And over the next 10 years or so, by 2031 or 20 years or so out, we would hit break even. And after that, you know, we basically own the house at that point. We're, we've got that investment paying for itself going forward. So just to summarize what you've seen, the original system was built at 8 cents a 100 cubic feet subsidy. That expired. Uh, no user paid systems have been built since 2006. Purchase water from MWD will exceed cost of recycled water around 2023. Um, the surcharge uh, would pay uh, for this expansion. And uh, the, the summary of the expansion itself, about 21 miles, which doubles the system. We add 36 new users, about 900 acre foot per year bringing our usage to about 2,500 acre feet per year, about $25 million in cost for a $0.12 cent, uh, monthly uh, surcharge, break even around 2031. And at that point, you're achieving a long-term benefit of having a local supply. So for your discussion is a requested action. Uh, you can ask us for additional information if you choose or if you feel comfortable our next step would be to go to council with uh, a similar presentation. So, we summarize this, return on investment is about 22 years? Yes. That's what it is. I think you've got it exactly, yes. <laughs> and normally, a project uh, gets the go ahead if if the return of investment is within ten years or less than that. 
uh, in government, as far as I know. Is that right? I think that's a good rule. Uh, I think it varies on the type of project and, and what parameters you're looking at. Um, the recycled water falls into a slightly different category in the sense that we really don't know what our, our long-term supply looks like at this point. Uh, there's a lot of uh, activity in Sacramento about uh, legislation and peripheral canals and legal issues about water and environmental concerns. All of those are kind of moving parts that we can't predict. We've taken a very simple approach here, and we're looking at a way to use a resource we already have in a better way. I would suspect that the first build on the recycle, the first 45 users that we had out there, probably had a payback very similar to what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So our first cut picked up those low-hanging fruit. This cut, they're more expensive. We don't really know what MWD costs are going to be like. You had 7% actually compounded annually, right? That was a compound 7%. Yes. It wasn't linear. Um, would it be helpful at all to break this up, uh, reflecting the uncertainty we have about this about the future, so that we're doing the cheapest ones maybe first as one capital project, let's say as phase one, with phase two being initiated after some more information became available in future years regarding what was going on, possibly? I think that approach makes a lot of sense, and that's exactly what we thought about. Plus, uh, I believe the way municipal bonds are structured from an arbitrage point of view, when we sell a bond, we have to expend those funds within three years. So if we're doing a five-year program, by definition, we'd have to do at least two sales of a bond. Mm -hmm. So that lends itself nicely to what you suggest. And as you saw from this list of projects, they are in order of their cost effectiveness. So then you have the choice of how, how low do you go in terms of its, uh, its absolute cost before you draw the line. Mm -hmm. The first several projects are fairly cost effective. Do we have any sense what, if let's say we did the first four, what kind of uh, surcharge per 100 cubic feet might result? We do. Um, the, the far column there should say cumulative yeah. debt service. Mm -hmm. So read that as such. And the first four projects, which would take you from Glendale Memorial, Disney South, Glendale, and Upper Crescenta, would have a four cent surcharge collectively to do those. And quickly looking at those numbers, well under a million dollars to fund that. And do we have any information about the community's ability? I'll skip the word willingness, <laughs> which is perhaps uh, not tactful on my part, but let's say their ability to, to fund something like that. Uh, we have not done any outreach at this point. This is strictly internal and, and now to the commission, so um, that may be a um, a good track attack to take is to describe what this is with some focus groups and see what uh, the response of the community would be. I, I think that would be prudent. I, I'm sure there's other comments here. Uh, I, I agree with John. I think by taking it in phases, just as you described, it will require at least two uh, sales anyway of bonds. Looking at the first four, um, you will achieve half the savings with just four cents surcharge. Yeah, it, and clearly yeah. in terms of cost effectiveness, those first four are the, the quad, twice yeah, as good you, as you the have other over ones. 400 or 445 acre feet. And actually, uh, what about the first three? I, I kind of lost it there. Um, Let me just go back to that yeah. one. First three are are still in the one cent surcharge mode. At how much is uh, that in terms of the total amount of uh, acre foot? Of the I'll have to um, switch to another graph. That, that's so. fine. One, yeah. 165 oh, okay. for the first three. But for the first four, is 445. The 165 is the 15, the 135, and the 15 again. And you can see there the estimated cost cumulative would be roughly $2 million. One, one idea here is that you could go ahead, let's say, with the first three and then revisit the issue in a couple of years. I, I realize that kind of wreaks havoc with a, with a strategic plan, which I think has a 900-acre-foot Yep. target, but 
if you have a process in place to review this every couple of years, you can uh, check. I, the reason I'm saying this is I, I suspect that 12 cents per 100 cubic feet would just be extremely onerous for the community, is my guess. I, I don't know that to be a fact, but I think it would be a concern. Well, and, and it, actually, the way these projects were broke out is each project is a unit by itself, so it's okay. very easy to just pick what you want to spend, and you'll have a, a set of projects there from a, the approach you're taking. We could easily do that, go after the first several, and it would still require the same type of ordinance change, just the amount you put in for the surcharge. That also allows us time to get some more information on what the state plans on doing in terms of yes. saving water in the, uh, not just with the getting around the Bay Delta, but the enormous amount of water that goes out into the into the Bay Area, into the ocean, because they don't have adequate storage and that sort of thing. Yes. Any other comments? I have a few, uh, Mr. Hayes. Well, thank you for a great presentation. This is very enlightening. And, you know, I'm not in favor of subsidized or cross subsidization of people who are interested in recycled water versus making the overall general rate pay, pay for this. But I do see a need to enhance our recycled water system. So I agree with Commissioner Chan and Commissioner Miller that we should go in phases and maybe start with the least cost effective one, the most cost effective one, and continue down the list. Because I see the last, the fifth year projects, those are way beyond 3,000 per acre foot. And especially the last one, getting obtaining only five acre foot for ten thousand, that's just um, something I don't think we should even pursue, because even though we want to reach our nine hundred acre foot, it's those type of projects that I think it's a, uh, it's something that the ratepayers wouldn't wouldn't appreciate or wouldn't agree to, if the, that customer actually want to install himself, I think those type of projects we can maybe help subsidize, but we wouldn't foot foot the bill for the entire amount. So I agree with let's proceed with the most cost effective one first, see what we can do with maybe minimize the, uh, the impact to the overall generate pay rate payers. And if we can only maybe obtain the first three years of worth of projects and have the rate payers pay maybe four cents per 100 cubic foot, I think that's something that the rate payers might be um, willing to accept and might be willing to um, maybe not scream too loud. That's be happy to take that direction and, and, and go the way you're suggesting. I would also like to reiterate, I think it would be prudent to try to get more of an assessment about the community's ability to pay. You mentioned focus groups. There's other techniques, but some that should be looked at. And in addition, I think you could set up some kind of a process, so to speak, where this is revisited every couple of years and we kind of expand depending on what's happening with regional water supplies and so forth. And, and as we're going at it, going back to uh, Commissioner Ibrahimian's comment, you know, these we can probably put in here what the payback period is for each of these, and that gives another indication. But you've got the general idea about what it costs and, and what we're up against in terms of potable water costs. So. And one last thing, Mr. Hayes, is the sensitivity of this. I know Mr. Commissioner Miller mentioned that there was a 7% assumption built into this. What about assuming a 20% increase a year, because that's what's been happening in the last year. Can we anticipate some kind of a sensitivity so that we can give a better perspective of if w these actually make sense now? Because if you have a higher order of magnitude, it could play into people's mind and acceptance. Uh, that, that too is uh, on my mind. It's been totally unpredictable. You know, MET has always been three or four years away from finishing their capital improvement plan. It's a harder constant. It's always three or four years away, and there's down the road another 20 percent increase. Uh, perhaps we do it along the lines that we've collectively been talking about is that we know what their projections are for this year and for next year. That's a two-year time frame. We've got projects that uh, fall into the cost-effective category for the first two years, and somewhere in there we, we come back again after we've gone through those first several projects with your approval and with council approval and see what it looks like again. But uh, in terms of putting in the 20 percent, it gets pretty scary yeah. pretty quickly in terms of a driver. Right. And we didn't want to over overstate that driver, but obviously, if they keep going at that rate, it, it makes it the payback period much, much faster. I think Commissioner Yao's point, though, is a, a sensitivity analysis: how quickly would the break even occur if you had twenty percent? Sure. 
presumably it occur rather quickly, but be happy to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also, I don't want to maybe sidestep the point that once we install the system, there's ongoing ONM and ongoing recapitalization that we have to maintain the system. So that's not really factor in, in here. Am I correct? Actually, it is. We put in about a 3% number per year for maintenance and operation. So the, the rate increase in this presentation assumes the subsidized um, percent per 100 cubic foot assumes the ongoing O&M as well. It does include that, yes. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. It was a uh, succinct and excellent presentation. Uh, moving on then to uh, item four on our agenda, backflow ordinance. Um, for the public's benefit, a backflow device is a, uh, a, a device that a uh, commercial or industrial typically a uh, customer needs to have to prevent uh, back siphonage or backflow of flow from inside their premises back into the water system under certain circumstances. So they consist of uh, reverse pressure principle devices, uh, check valves, air gaps, and a variety of other components, but basically uh, the most common one is a reverse pressure principle backflow device. We have an ordinance for this. It's been in place uh, roughly about 15, 16 years. It hasn't been updated since that time. Uh, we have very limited amount of staff who can address this, and we have about 2,200 backflow devices in the city. We continue, however, to discover new devices. When the ordinance was put in place, the infrastructure was already out there, and we did not have an inventory of it. So over this last 15, 16 years, we've been continuing to discover devices. It's important that we have all of them in our database. Discover what? I'm sorry. Backflow devices. Okay. There is a fee associated with those devices which hasn't updated since 2002. So uh, the proposed ordinance we have will, um, will reduce some of our notification requirements, which are pretty onerous. We have to send a notice 30 days and then another follow-up notice two weeks later if there's not a response. It takes away the second notification. But more importantly, uh, if someone is not complying, Currently, we only have one option. That's either to get them to comply, ideally, or to turn their water off. There are certain sensitive users uh, in the city where it's just not practical to do that. What the ordinance change will allow us to do is, is conduct the backflow testing that's required annually with our own um, staff or contract staff and keep uh, available a water supply without shutting off their water. I think that's a significant improvement in the ordinance to the present one we have. And it will hopefully uh, keep our compliance uh, at a high level. So that's what the, the ordinance does. It also um, puts in some uh, civil penalties if you're not complying. And we have very few users who don't comply, but we do have that handful that take up a lot of staff time. Uh, on this issue of um, having city of staff do it, is there an idea of uh, some kind of cost recovery of the user who, who chooses that option? Absolutely. That would be built into the new ordinance that uh, any costs associated with uh, having the testing done, and, and typically I misstated that. We, we would, even though we have certified testers on staff, we would likely bring in a contractor to do that. Typical fees for doing that work are anywhere from 50 to $150 per device. And if he, uh, if the user failed to get the test in a timely manner, the city would simply just go ahead and do the test and make the repairs and then charge the customer? Yes, that would be one of our options. We still have, if we think it's an egregious situation, we can turn the water off. Okay. That still remains. But um, from a customer service point of view, the better option is to, is to have the ability to go out and have the test done and keep them in compliance, and this new ordinance change will allow us to do that. Uh, you mentioned new backflow prevention assemblies. Uh, are these You're referring, I think, to new ones that are being on the market that are available for use. Yes. But uh, are, does the city subscribe or have any liaison with USC's Foundation for Cross-Connection Control and Hydraulic Research, which maintains a list of these approved devices? We, we certainly do. Um, several of our staff have been to that uh, there's several la layers to that training program and have been involved in it since the, its origins uh, back in the early 1990s. Uh, the reason I suggest that is since USC uh, actively researches new devices and indicates whether they're, they're 
they suggest that they be used by municipalities or not, uh, that would ease some of the burden of monitoring for the city of Glendale. You could simply just use their list. Yes, and I think we're, in fact, uh, the ordinance has uh, tables in it that are modeled right after USC's uh, program. Does the, does the ordinance actually make reference to using uh, the foundation's list as it gets updated? Th uh, that might be. I don't believe it does. Uh, you might want to look into that. That might. Doreen? I don't think we reference anything about the list per se. It's it's a static list rather than saying oh, I see. something from U.S. I see. Well, just as a suggestion, you, you may want to look at, at having Certainly. it reference that because then it would just eliminate a lot of grief for the city. You'd be using a panel of professional experts who do nothing but evaluate these things. They're, that's all they do over there. They're just checking these things. Thanks for the suggestion. We'll see if we can incorporate that. Were you looking for our suggestion as to whether to urge council to approve this or not? Or? Um, I wanted to inform you that we were going there. We'll probably be there on the second. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for the clarification. No further action was asked. Appreciate your comments. Uh, the last, was there another question? Last item on our agenda is the Chevy Chase uh, update. Uh, as you know, we had substantial completion and we used the reservoir and pump station as of uh, August this year. We're in the, the last few items. There is uh, a little bit of a problem with uh, completing the landscaping work. Uh, golf courses, as you may be aware, have particular needs for types of grasses they use. And uh, there were some delays, uh, all uh, valid delays early in the project, that have put us into, uh, as we approach the winter months, some difficulty in finding the grass that will grow during those months. So uh, we are laying sod. Sod was started to be laid uh, early last week. But uh, we are rapidly approaching a, a cool part of the year, and these types of grasses do go dormant. So our contractor, uh, SEMA has done a, an excellent job staying on top of this. Uh, they're telling us everything's going to be okay, but it is a concern I need to raise um, as a potential uh, issue down the road. May I ask, is it a concern that could be potential litigation for the city, or is this something that just... Um, potential litigation may be a bit strong. I, I think um, we, we've had a, a strong working relationship between us and the the golf course since the beginning so usually things uh, have been working out to everyone's satisfaction so hopefully we'll continue on that track okay thank you thank you thank you and I have a request to um, speak I'd like to invite mr. Herbert Milano please Commissioner uh, Yao and commissioners my name is Herbert Milano I'd like to address two items here, uh, item two on water conservation and item three on the recycling. Um, as you are probably aware, the city has just completed a brief quality of life indicators that's available on the web. And I think that very few things are so important to the general public as the availability of water and electricity. And I keep asking uh, for information that could be made available um, relative to how we're doing with regard to conservation. I went on the website and I pulled out a report, it's available in one of the PDFs there, concerning water use report from 2008. And I made some brief calculations and this is what I found. But in 2006, the average dwelling in Glendale used 292 gallons per day. In 2007, 312. And in 2008, 296 gallons. So we can say around that the average dwelling use is 300 gallons per day. Now there's a big disparity between what a multifamily home will use and what a single family will use. And I think that we need to put some targets with regard to that, and I think it's doable in grabbing from the database information that says, look, if there's numbers attached to the, like a unit number and apartment number, that we define what that average usage is. Sixty. A little over 60% of the population in Glendale lives in multifamily. Um, so that means to me that the average usage per household has got to be upwards of 400 gallons a day. And I think we need to have that information available so that people have a sense of 
you know, what their goals might be and what the availability of water might be in the future and its cost. And I think that anyone wanted to move into Glendale or wanted to know how we're doing, they should know about, you know, what is expected of them in terms of average usage and whether they live in a single dwelling or in a multifamily uh, apartment unit and also the costs that are expected for those. Um, also, I wanted to bring up that there have been some recent approvals of high-rise multifamily buildings, and I was wondering if those high-rises come to you for your input with regard to are they single-metered, you know, in the multifamily. If our goal is eventually to go to smart meters, I figure that that kind of water conservation approach so that every unit is metered will allow you to provide that information for water conservation to the, to the individual uh, residents. Um, second, on the water recycling, the interesting thing that I find about the recycling has been an interest of mine for quite a long time, is that the infrastructure that has been in place is in close proximity to the commercial areas. And commercial usage is only about 16% of the, of the usage of water in Glendale. So, and the cost to tie those in, if they're in close proximity, like right across from where those uh, recycling water mains are, obviously those costs could probably be more justifiable for them. If those new high-rises, for example, well, by the way, high-rise commercial buildings are required to have multiple plumbing, and which includes the recycling plumbing. So it means internally they're already wired for that, if I can call that plumbed for, for uh, recycled water. So the, if a building is coming into the redevelopment area, then there is perhaps another way of looking at financing of that, of using redevelopment money to encourage those buildings to tap into the, uh, uh, into the recycling water uh, objectives. There's another area of, of funding that we are forgetting. The $4 million a year that are transferred from GWP to the general fund may be the issue that Mr. Steiger refers to as probably might be litigated because it's, you know, as far as the, the courts have decided, it's it's probably not an appropriate way of, uh, of funding the general fund using those monies transferred from the water. That, so that if those $4 million were made available, you know, so in the course of six years, you probably have pretty much the funding that you need without basically having to go through other additional funds. What the, what the rest of Glendale must do is that the general fund and all those expenses of the general fund have to be looked at. And if Glendale were judicious about its use of, of its expenditures, I should say, you know, that are covered by the general fund, then there would be enough money to basically to cover it, given the current rates. Although I would love to see some reduction in rates for those people who are in dire need of assistance. Thank you very much. Next item, please. Item 3C, Customer Service and Support Services. Report number one, Customer Notification System Rollout. President Yao, members of Commission Tammy Vallier, Customer Services Administrator. Just a quick update on the citizen notification system. As a refresher, we contracted with Everbridge for our mass communication system, uh, which is capable of uh, calling, emailing, texting, faxing our residents with emergency notification as well as uh, non-emergency notifications uh, for important city business. We are currently in phase two of the notification solution which is the piece that allows customers to self-register their contact information. We currently have our AT&T 911 database information and we have our GWP customer information. However, we're um, really encouraging our citizens to go ahead and self-register when it's available so that we have not only the most current information but numbers that we might not have access to such as cell phones and emails. Um, the solution will also give citizens the opportunity to opt in and receive non-emergency messages such as road closures, uh, crime bulletins, community events. It will also give them the ability to register other locations uh, that might be important to them such as their child's school address or work address. Uh, we submitted our system configurations to Everbridge on October 12th. They're due back to us November 12th. Um, at that time we'll do a press release. We will have an article in City Views letting customers know that it's available. And at the next commission meeting, I plan to do a presentation and walk you through step by step the process. That's my update. If you have any questions. Oh, one, Ms. Valle, thank you for that presentation. How are we dealing with the uh, cell phones and text messaging? Is 
I mean, my understanding is there's some laws against that. Do we have customers actively opt in to be able to for us to contact them through a cell phone? We do. That's part of the opt-in process. Is if they pro- if they want to provide that information to us, then well, let me back up a little bit. If they're AT and T cell phone users, there's a chance that that was submitted with the AT and T um, information that the police department subscribed to. Uh, but like myself, I'm a Verizon user, so my cell phone information didn't come over to that. If they opt in, they can choose a variety of different paths that we can contact them, and cell phones, one of them, email, um, fax. Um, I think there's 18 different devices that people can um, put contact information on. They can also select then the priority in which they would like us to contact those paths. So first contact me email, next contact me on my cell, last contact me on my telephone at home. Great. We'll be using this information for other purposes, such as providing um, PVC programs. If Is this intended just for the notification? The emergency, if it's an emergency notification, a true emergency, we can use that without any type of authorization. The opt-in... piece of this will allow customers to choose what they want to hear about that's non-emergency. So GWP information is one that they can select. If they don't select that, then no, we would not be contacting them with those types of messages. Okay. Crime bulletins is another um, community events, citywide and community events uh, in their specific area. Um, We do have up to nine different types of messages uh, that we can add to the system. And in this first, in this phase, I think we only have four or five, but there's room to grow in the system. And for the viewers at home, I mean, I want them to feel confident that the information they submit, that they, when they self-register, that the information will be used for a legitimate reason, that it won't be sold or be used um, anything else besides legitimate business use? Yes, and we have that in the article that's going Great. Right. Thank you. We did adopt the administrative fee that will be used to assess GWP and other utilities. Uh, um, however, that the proceedings are now closed, but they'll be reopening again once they issue the 15-day language later this fall. Um, the regulations will become effective in spring 2010, and ARB will be sending out the first invoices in fall 2010. Um, there are a few uh, main exceptions to the fee. One of them is that uh, no fee shall be paid for electricity generated at a plant that is less than one megawatt or emits less than 25 metric tons of CO2 or its equivalent. The fee shall, shall be paid for, uh, no fee shall be paid for any electricity generated at a cogen plant. Uh, No fees shall be applied to power wheeled through California in the course of a transaction. Um, And for simultaneously exchanged power, there will be no fee assessed. Seasonal exchanges are not covered by that exemption, though. Uh, 
On October 12th, ARB also conducted a workshop on enforcement, obviously for a regulatory body. That is their primary concern, is how they're going to enforce all of their regulations. Um, partly, their three primary goals that they covered were to obtain immediate compliance, since the air standards are health-based, to achieve a level playing field among the regulated entities in the interest of fairness to those who have complied, and because consistent enforcement will advance program integrity. Finally, they would like to create a deterrence by conducting frequent and fairly aggressive uh, spontaneous um, inspections and assessing appropriate penalties for any violations that they find there. They did go on to um, make several comments about GHGs in general, uh, greenhouse gases, and the Sacramento Municipal Utility District, otherwise known as SMUD, did point out a really important distinction between uh, criteria, pollutant emissions, and GHG emissions, and did recommend that they would consider um, a, a exempting GHG emissions from their normal violation because of um, what they call the daily fine structure. So as opposed to looking at the daily fines because it is regulated over a period of time to look at a different fee structure for that. Finally, and sort of um, very interestingly, the um, ARB held its first public workshop on the renewable electricity standard, which is coming out of the executive order that was signed by the governor after the renewable portfolio standard bills were vetoed by the governor. That was held last Friday, and I was in Sacramento for that. Um, our uh, CARB actually released the concept paper for their uh, process that they want to move to immediately preceding the meeting. So 8.30 was when they sent it out for a 9 o'clock meeting or a hearing. Uh, the paper did re uh, raise a few issues that were uh, not uh, noticed and um, discussed a little bit at the meeting, um, including whether the compliance obligation should be stated in megawatt hours or metric tons of emissions. There's some question about the legal scope of uh, AB 32 and how far it would extend it to using a different metric for measurement. Uh, the flexible compliance provisions, including an expanded compliance period of three years as opposed to annual or quarterly. Um, geographic limits, if any, you'll remember that was a major point of contention with the RPS bills, whether it was going to be in-state only or allowing out-of-state energy, renewable energy, and that was one of the issues. And also an exclusion of load if served by CHP or distributed gen. So um, currently the renewable electricity standard is slated for discussion and adoption at the Ju July 22, uh, 2010 CARB meeting. For the legislative update, so I had spoken to you just the week before the legislative deadline had occurred. That deadline was October 11th, and the governor had laid down some rules for the uh, members of the legislature that if they were not going to come to some agreement on the water package that was before them by October 9th at midnight, that he was going to blanket veto all of the bills on his desk. That actually would have been disastrous. And happily, they made enough progress in private communications that although the agreement was not reached, um, that he did move, up, move forward and sign certain bills. And you have a list of the CMUA bills that he did sign into uh, law. Um, however, uh, both AB 64 and SB 14 were vetoed. With regards to the water package that is currently before, he called a special session on water. And uh, we just today, before, right before 1 o'clock, we received notice from MWD's legislative staff in Sacramento. And her update, I'm just going to read what she said. Uh, it's Kathy Cole. And she says, the dust seems to have settled on the amendments for the Senate and the Assembly Delta package, finally. As I'm sure you've heard, a vote is anticipated today or tomorrow on the package. The assembly, bills, uh, the assembly policy bills are separate measures, but passage of the Delta Governance and Delta Plan proposal is contingent on the passage of the Conservation, Groundwater, and Water Rights Enforcement Bills. The In-Delta Diversion Reporting Bill, uh, which is a hotly contested portion of the, of the uh, package, the Delta Conservancy and Delta Protection Commission Bills, and the bond are not linked and stand on their own merits. In the Senate, Senator Simidian and Steinberg are carrying the Delta Governance Plan, um, Delta Plan Conservation, Delta Council, Conservancy, and Water Master Proposal in one policy bill. Several others are separate policy bills, um, but they are all joined to the passage of the, of the policy package uh, called SB, SB7X1. And the appropriation bill is structured to provide funding for the Delta Stewardship Council, the conservancy, and other purposes should the bond fail. So we're just waiting to find out today or tomorrow what, what the information is. But it has been all over the map, so it's going to be a really interesting to find out how it all shakes down. Um, SB 407 was mentioned in your packet because it was an issue of particular interest to our city council who had contemplated putting in a local ordinance requiring water conserving plumbing fixtures. Uh, that was chaptered into law and is now currently um, will be going into effect. Um, I believe the first date that that starts is uh, January 1st, 
2014, if I, I'm doing it for memory, I don't have it with me right now. On the federal level, as you um, will have heard, that Carrie Boxer, which is now the Senate version of the Waxman-Markey climate change bill, has been released, and there is um, it's, it's modeled very closely after Waxman-Markey, which was the House version of the bill. Um, for some additional notes, I, I'm really actually very excited to tell you that on November 17th, you are going to be hosting a joint special study session on, this, on the Sacramento and San Joaquin um, River Delta. Uh, Mr. Kurt Schmoody, who was a speaker during the MWD tour that a uh, couple of you took, is going to be there. And we've also invited Kathy Cole to come and give a legislative update as well at that time. So if, if I could, just for the public to read so that they know what it is, uh, that the purpose of the joint study session is to educate the council, the other members of the commission here, as well as the public about the importance of the, of the River Delta to um, to Glendale and to the Southern California region in particular, as well as its relationship to reliable water supply. It does supply about 30 percent of Southern California's water, so it is integral and it is in a dire crisis at this time. So water supply issues, as Mr. Hayes was talking about, are really at the forefront of the conversation in California right now. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Yes, I, I did want to encourage anyone in the public who's watching to watch the show on November 17th. It's going to deal with uh, some awfully critical issues affecting the state and its water supply. And I think just to give a heads up on it, I, as I understand, I think we have 70 percent of the state's water supply passing through the area. Um, there are uh, levees there that are not engineered, built actually by manual labor some time ago, restraining uh, ocean water from this state's water supply, which is in a subsided area, actually below sea level. If those were to collapse in an earthquake, we would be facing a major catastrophe in the state affecting its economy. It's an urgent issue that needs to be addressed, and I encourage uh, the public generally to, uh, to learn about this issue during the presentation of the 17th. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next item, please. Item 3E, Electric, report number one, Electrical Services Reliability Indices. Uh, good evening, President Yao, members of the Commission. Ramona Boeg, Assistant General Manager, Electrical Services. Uh, first, on the good news, uh, we had our first major windstorm on October 20th that uh, Tuesday night, and I'm glad to say that we only had one minor problem that affected about 70 customers. Uh, it's a tap that uh, fuse blew because of a tree branch falling on it, and it's a good indication, too, that the fuse coordination projects that we're working on are working. Uh, in the past, if that happened, it would have taken out the whole theater. In this case, it only took out that area. Additionally, we had five minor calls. Uh, we call them secondary calls. Uh, people re uh, reporting that there's three branches on the server service wires that went by their house. So overall, I'm happy to report that uh, the efforts we're putting in in making our system more robust is uh, apparently working. Uh, then last month, however, we had six major outages. Uh, two of them are caused by my favorite uh, squirrels, uh, and th those outages affected about 1,500 customers, uh, about 500 of which are affected by 20 minutes and another 1,000 by uh, 9 minutes. Uh, we did have uh, three outages due to what we consider equipment or part failure. We have one outage that's caused by one of our service wires overheating. Uh, we haven't quite determined what's, if it's due to age or overloading. We haven't. We don't have any indication, but uh, we don't have a resolution to that yet. Uh, we do have a, um, a cable that failed, an underground cable, and that uh, took us a while to find where the problem was in front of a customer on Lumita. And we had a termination that failed on Tropical Substation that took half uh, half of our 4 kV bus out that affected a lot of customers. Um, and one last outage we have is caused by a palm front, basically just flying over the line. These outages, uh, as it affects the indices that we track on a 12-month rolling average, the SIFI, or the Interruption Frequency Index per customer, if we took the average, is still less than one, which we're still meeting our, our goal. 
the average interruption index, if we took all the customers into consideration, is still under 40 minutes. However, the KID, which is the indication of if you're a customer and you did have an outage, the average is over, uh, it's about 51 minutes, which is over our goal, or we're not meeting our goal on that one. And there's some factors we're looking at to see where we can make the improvements. Uh, some of those outages happened either late at night or after hours, so part of that really is trying to get crews in to, to get the uh, power restored. So we're working on hopefully resolving those and meeting our goals, getting back to our goals. Uh, um, I, I noticed um, the outage that um, affected the most customers by far, the number four, uh, affected 3,500, over 3,500 customers. And that's due to a failure of an insulator. That's correct. Um, so um, I'm just curious, in your opinion, how do we prevent that? Well, on this particular one, there's actually an insulation problem. This was uh, repaired three years ago, and it turned out the insulator in this case was improperly installed. So one of the phases failed. And rather than waiting for it to fail, is we looked at all the work that was done for that period and we replaced everything that were done similarly. So in this particular case, we believe we, we have uh, identified and resolved the issue. So are we proactively uh, evaluating, checking, um, how are you doing it, like yeah. with the, the, the whole system? Is yeah. there a plan? Yeah, for every outage that we have, if it's something new, if it's something we can't uh, determine. For example, that particular outage, we looked at not only the installation itself, we also look at the relay, because the way it failed, uh, at the risk of being too technical or using jargon, uh, we have a bus differential relay that failed since uh, that operated, and since it's within the substation, we took a look at is the relay operating fast enough to prevent it from having a catastrophic failure? Should it have blown or should it have just stripped? Mm -hmm. In this case, everything was working fine, but there was this not enough buildup build up of an arc that we could have not prevented it. We tested the relay, so we did not focus on that just what failed, but the components that control the failure or the outage are all the parts working properly. We look at the breaker operating time, we tested that. Uh, those are uh, supposed to operate within two and a half cycles after detecting the fault. Everything worked as it was designed, except for the actual installation itself. Mm -hmm. So it was installed improperly? That's correct. Okay, so are you also looking at possibly the insulators that were uh, installed like around the same time frame or by the same crew? We did that already. Oh, okay. And this was done by a contractor, so. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, it, perhaps I should have asked uh, the former speaker regarding this. Whatever became of the motion to uh, regulate Mylar balloon sales? That, I believe, is not going anywhere because their lobbyists apparently are, are better than ours. <laughs> well, I, let me comment on that. I think what, what happened is that we had a proposal to, to outlaw the sale, and I think if we tried to meet with the industry leaders and talked about ways to you know, brought our problems to their attention and asked for them to help us so they could sell their stuff more easily, we might have a better better luck in that. Yeah, we continuously or continually talk about that in our SCAPA board, see what we can do, see if we have common problems. So it's something that we haven't really dropped. We are continuously looking at what we can do and trying to learn from what they've done. Uh, at this time, no one has come up with that magic bullet that can shoot the balloons down, so to speak. Uh, so it's, but it is a constant subject that we talk about on a monthly basis. Well, in, in lieu of regulation, we might try exploring meeting with the industry leaders to see if there's something we could do. I just want to toss that idea out. Thanks. All right. All right, thank you very much. Uh, next, oh, next item, please. Item four, oral communications. And I have three requests to speak. I'd like to invite first Mr. or Ms. Escott Norton. Mr. Mr. Norton, please. Okay, if I set this here? Sure. Good 
good afternoon or evening. Evening, G um, Water and Power Commissioners. I wrote this down because I'm fairly nervous and, and speaking in front of a crowd and I want to try to keep it to five minutes, so I won't go off on tangents. <clears throat> uh, my name is S. Scott Norton. My home is at 3310 Buckingham Road in Glendale. I'm speaking before you today about a ridiculous conflict I'm having with GWP. Instead of listening to reason, I am getting stonewalled and ignored. I've spent the last eight years of my life designing, getting approvals, and building my dream home. Uh, from the beginning, I set out to build a special, energy-efficient, environmentally sensitive home. You can ask anyone, family, friends, my neighbors, subcontractors, city inspectors. I'm very much against waste and go out of my way to save re resources. This is why I was shocked when I got my bill for April, May of 2009. For the previous two years during construction, I'd never had a water bill totaling more than $120. And that includes an all, an all concrete house. So uh, there was water used during the construction. But all of a sudden, my bill was $5,474.41. That's 45 times my previous highest bill. That's for 1,536,392 gallons in 64 days, which works out to 24,006 gallons per day. This chart from the GWP, uh, generated by the GWP website, shows my average use and my street's average use up until the spike, and then it goes back down to uh, a fairly normal level. This is enough to fill two 12-foot swimming pools per day for 64 days, or six 4,000-gallon tankers per day for 64 days. Everyone, including the GWP employees that I've talked to, thinks this is ridiculous. Yet I'm being forced to pay this water I did not use. I tried to resolve this through the regular channels, appealed to the GWP to use logic, and eventually filed a formal dispute. It was rejected on the basis that the meter was right. And that's the only, that is the only um, basis that I was uh, denied, uh, according to the, the, um, the report. I was told of only one test, a water meter accuracy test, that was performed. It showed the meter was running a little high, but within acceptable standards. Therefore, I must pay. I have so far paid over $3,000 towards this bill as instructed. Frustrated by the unfairness uh, of the situation, I also told my story to the Glendale News Press. Uh, the response uh, by everyone who has read it, who, who has talked to me, has been disbelief, except for that of Mr. Steiger. His response to the story, uh, and I'm going to quote him from, from an article that was in response, uh, his response was laughable, in my, in my opinion. It was so inaccurate. Uh, first, he mentions, and I'm quoting, extraordinary measures and a series of tests. They only sent me vague results from one test. I think if they had done more tests at the time, they should have sent me the results. I think the burden of proof is on them. Steiger says, and I quote, honestly, after testing it as many ways as we know how, we found nothing wrong. He said, zero. The fact, according to their own report, is the meter tested high, but within allowable levels. So I don't really consider that zero. It's, it seemed like he was trying to brush off the, the reporter. Uh, let me quote again. The utility did calculate that a hose on Norton's property could have used exactly 1.5 million gallons of water if it was left on for 64 days, the period of the billing cycle in question. And that water could have spilled into a storm drain in front of his home, Steiger said. First, there is no storm drain in front of my home. The water would have had to flow down Buckingham, turn left on Chevy Chase, flow across Chevy Chase, and then back across Chevy Chase as it wound down the hill to the nearest storm drain, which is 800 feet away from my home. It's a long hose. Second, that hose would have had to be running 24 hours a day for the entire 64 days at 17 gallons per minute. My water pressure only allows between 2 and 6 gallons per minute, depending on what is on, what else is on. I think someone, at least one of the more than 10 inspectors during that period of time, would have noticed the 800-foot-long hose running at 17 gallons per minute. Bill Mace, uh, Assistant General Manager of Water at Burbank's Utility, uh, also suggested in the same article that a running toilet could use up to 14 gallons per day. I have five toilets. If all were running 24 hours, that would be 7,000 gallons per day. And again, 
if they were all running 24 hours a day for 64 days, many people besides myself would have noticed. So, all of my toilets and a hose turned on full blast, allowing for no other water usage for 64 days. That would only equal 1 million gallons and 960. And we're still short a half million gallons. This is ludicrous. If there was a leak under my house, another suggestion that was made. Under almost 500 tons of concrete, my home is solid concrete, floors, walls, ceilings, foundation, it would have had to soak through solid rock. I have my soils report here to show. And my house wouldn't have sunk into a sinkhole the size of a few swimming pools. Well, Mr. Norton, I think we get your point, and if you can just wrap it up quickly. Okay, all right, all right. It's insulting and ridiculous. This is where it's, it's personal to me. It's insulting and ridiculous that the numbers on a meter are held over my reputation, the eyewitness accounts of neighbors, and logic. As far as I know, the only thing GWP can prove is that the meter shows certain numbers. There is no proof that a huge amount of water poured through it. Do they have one eyewitness to the river water flowing down or the 364 tanker trucks backed up to my house for 16 hours a day for two months? Were there any complaints lodged against me by neighbors or city officials? And, and the other... Thank you. If, you. if you think that maybe this water usage happened for one day, two days, three days, the entire 64 days, I would have had to know the day that the meter res was read and then stop wasting the water for those 10 days that inspectors were there and any other witnesses, and then start it again, and then stop it again right before the next meter read. I urge you to act to reverse this billing error and to apply a credit of the amount in excess of my next highest bill. I would be satisfied with this outcome and will not pursue any further action. I've submitted copies of all the pertinent documents as well as the, news, the, the newspaper reviews and letters to the editor. I have five copies here, which you can have. Yes, and, th and thank you for that. I think, I, we, I think I've seen all of I think most of us have. And if uh, Mr. Sykin can, we, can respond to that, I think uh, we all appreciate having Mr. Horn in front of us. So that can be for the record. Okay. Uh, what Mr. Norton has, uh, has described in terms of the facts of the meter being read, uh, and tested are correct, and I'll add a little bit to that. There's not, I, I can't uh, describe everything. That, there's privacy laws that uh, restrict what I can say here. Uh, and let me say right up front, Mr. Norton, that you do have the right to formally appeal to this commission. And uh, rather than get into a long discussion today, um, I would suggest and urge you to, to do that, okay, to make a formal appeal uh, to the commission. However, uh, j just to hit some of the, the other pieces of this, there are other um, extenuating circumstances that I cannot men mention, but we can at some future date, uh, that do impact this situation. But I do want to mention the testing. Uh, the test, there was more than one test. I witnessed uh, two of them. Uh, there, were, there was the test, the formal test that you were uh, that you received a response to. Uh, we tested it again for our own purposes after that, where we're not required necessarily to, you know, to respond to you. We will, though. We will provide that to you. Uh, same result. Uh, we also tested it by literally putting a volume of water through the meter uh, to try to simulate that volume of water, which also tested positively in, in that regard. And we also uh, analyze the register itself, which is quite unusual. It's not something we would normally do, but given the situation, we tested the register to make sure that the register itself uh, didn't fail or, or was not influenced by outside vibrations or other such things. So we did everything we possibly could, uh, which is far and away uh, well beyond the norm, uh, to test this meter to try to find a reason to corroborate the fact that the water did not pass through there. Our conclusion is the water passed through there. So that's our conclusion without going into any other details at this point. But uh, I, as I would mention to you, uh, I would urge you to, uh, to present a formal um, hearing here. I had a couple of questions. Uh, what's the size of the meter? Uh, one inch. One inch, okay. It, was it uh, checked for any kind of tampering or anything like that yes. right afterwards. Yes, it was. And, and nothing was found to N Nothing tampering. obvious, no. Okay. Hmm. Uh, how does the formal complaint procedure work? Uh, Christine? Um, that's something that I would need to investigate for you, and I could certainly speak with you about that separately. Okay. 
Could you also advise us? <laughs> Absolutely. I could Thank do so you. at the next meeting. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Nguyen. I think we are done. Okay. I'd like to invite um, Ms. Stephanie Schoes. President Yao, Commissioners, Mr. Steiger. Um, my name is Stephanie Schuss. We moved from Bethesda, Maryland about seven, eight years ago, and I have to say I was shocked that you guys didn't already have a system where individuals could tap into a recycled water system to water their landscaping. I mean, we I came from a place where there was quite a bit of rain, and we had that system, so water has always sort of been an issue, particularly when it became almost drought. I mean, we're really in a drought area, I mean, a desert area, so everything seems, it seems as if people should be very sensitive to water. What I've just brought forth, and I have some copies of this, are some more suggestions, and perhaps it's Mr. Hayes and some of his staff that would be more interested in this, but I offer it to you, to the public, to whoever might happen to be listening of certain things that might be added to um, help the city of Glendale reduce its overall water use uh, more on an individual basis, but a lot of it's a matter of communications and maybe encouragement. Um, one of them that's a very timely issue, it just seems, and maybe if it's, you know, I maybe have not, have not seen some of the communications, but one of them is a practice that people seem to have in this community to overseed, I guess it's called, their lawns for winter lawns, and that takes a tremendous amount of water. So I don't know whether it's part of your water restriction program to limit that, at least for this year, but I would strongly urge you to add that to your list of things that people should not be doing this year. Um, I think it's very commendable that we're all reducing our water usage, or enough of us are, to get those 16 and 18 percent reductions, but this is an ongoing problem and people should be aware of this and, and are eventually going to have to change their way of, you know, of de dealing with the landscape. Um, the other thing is I really tried on your website, on the, um, the WaterWise website, some of the links to that, to find recommendations for low water usage grasses. I finally found one through um, somebody had, had mailed me a link and apparently there's a buffalo grass, it's called buffalo grass, it was developed by I think one of the, UC, the um, University of California colleges and it claims to reduce the need for water by 75 percent. Um, it looks great online, I mean I have no idea what it, I've never seen it, but it would be really a wonderful thing I think for maybe as part of the demonstration gardens that we have outside of the community garden or as part of the, there is a, I know a native planting garden um, someplace, I think it's, um, it's on San Fernando, um, which I must say is not all that attractive. <laughs> Um, to at least have maybe a plot of this, and I can give you, um, you'll see the website when I give it to you. Um, the other grass, that they, the other variety that's recommended on that side is Bella bluegrass. Um, but my main point, and I'm sorry I took that much time before, is the major savings that I feel when I drive around all of Glendale is to eliminate the use of grass in your parkway strips. I don't understand that. Parkway strips, for anybody that doesn't know, is between the sidewalk and the curb. Everybody has to maintain the grass. And I did a quick calculation. Um, our strip is 36 feet by 9, inch, nine feet. It has approximately 12 pop-up sprinklers. According to Rainbird, it del these deliver 0 0.65 to 1.2 gallons of water per minute, depending on, and this is a conservative look, um, this is depending on the um, pressure and the spray pattern, which means that each strip, the water consumption per minute is 7.8 to 14.4 gallons per minute. If you follow your recommendation to water three times a week, 10 minutes, it means that one parkway strip is taking 234 to 40, 432 gallons per week, which means that if you only water um, eight months a year or approximately 34 weeks, 
This works out to be close to 8,000 to 15,000 gallons of water a year for just one parking strip. If you then project that out to one mile of parking strips, it means that it's 1.2 to 2.1 million gallons of water being consumed for these silly little, I'm sorry, but obviously I have an aesthetic um, bias um, for these strips. Um, I realize I'm going to run over, but um, I don't think this makes sense. I have some suggestions on, in terms of challenges that you know need to be faced because it's expensive and it's a lot of physical labor, but to get rid of the grass, I think that there's a way to encourage it and use maybe the Glendale Youth Alliance for um, you know to to help with the labor. Um, they also don't pay for dumping the grass. They have an arrangement with a sports complex. So this is what I would like to submit to you for your consideration and you know, do with it whatever you want. I've been speaking to some of my neighbors. We're considering it. Maybe the Homeowners Association would like to get involved, but I think it could save a, a significant amount of water. Thank you. Thank you. And the last speaker, Mr. Herbert Milano, please. Commission President Yao, uh, Commissioners, uh, Mr. Um, I would like to, uh, my name is Herbert Milano, I would like to do a presentation using the city's website so I can give you a brief overview of the quality of life indicators, if I may. I want to actually access the, the part of the, of the website where we have the, the, uh, the Department of Water and Power data. I'm sorry, you're proposing a PowerPoint? Well, it's, it's not a PowerPoint, it's the city's own website which is available on the internet. Um, well, that's within the discretion of the chair. Typically, we request advance notice of that, but I will leave that within the discretion of the chair. Well, here, let me give you a preview first, uh, uh, President Yao. Look, the, um, for a very long time, I've been proposing generally this, I mean, I've been talking to different commissions on the same theme. You know, for a city to be governed with as much transparency as possible. Um, for the city to be as equitable as possible to all its citizens. And for there to be accountability by city government towards those individuals who have basically elected city officials to be, you know, for this self-governance. At the end of the day, it's about self-governance. The, um, but somehow, if we do not oversee what takes place, if we are not, should we say, looking over the shoulders of what the city is doing, you know, many governments oftentimes can become uh, quite distant and, uh, and unresponsive. I, I think the example that you see with Mr. Norton there, it's, it's just one of them. We had a similar situation before uh, with another resident who had a bill for $365,000 for trimming her trees. And yet the concern for the resident wasn't there. The concern about protecting staff and its methods. And, and in a bureaucracy, you know, bureaucrats tend to do the same things all over, you know, again and again, a certain set of procedures, and you follow that. But sometimes we have to look at other ways of imparting to the public how a government is working. And that has been my advocacy for a very long time. And I would love to see numbers that appear to the general public on a frequent basis, numbers that are truly relevant, that allows for policymakers to say, are we headed in the right direction? What I would love to see, what you, if I, I wanted to show you those numbers, because some of those are not truly as relevant as we could make them to the general public who are going to look at that. So we're given overall usage in, in uh, megawatts. You know, we, we used uh, um, one billion kilowatt hours, I think, or some number like that. But those numbers are not truly really that, that relevant, or a million megawatts overall in the city. And uh, it is nice to impart to the general public some things. You know, residents use a third of the electricity, commercial establishment use a third, industrial use a third. That's a pretty nice, easy way of explaining it. But that doesn't lead to policy decisions. Policy decisions come when you make the information so clear and so relevant that people will begin to, to personalize the information in a way that they can take action themselves or they can recommend to a city council to take action. Now, from my calculations, the average usage per day is about 15 kilowatt hours per day per resident, per, re per dwelling in Glendale. Now, I look at those numbers and compare it to my personal usage at my home, which is a little over 10 kilowatt hours per day. And then when it came to water, we use roughly about 100 gallons per day. The, um, again, 
I am concerned about the environment, and I want information that is relevant. And I would love to be able to see how other communities are doing, who are doing the best at conserving water, doing the best at conserving energy, doing their best at conserving, you know, their own personal usage. And so we need to provide information that is easily accessible, like on the web, with regard to what those numbers are. You know, given us a number that we use, you know, a, a million megawatts or whatever the number is, are so incredibly distant that it doesn't really allow for the public to really get engaged. The same thing with regards to the issues of the public benefit. For example, displaying in there how many people have asked for or requested for either a break on their, on their electricity rate or who are waiting for a reduction in electricity rate. And then the ranking of that electricity rate vis-a-vis for example, the rest of, of the state. I mentioned to you before that last year at the study by Roseville, the city of Roseville, that we were the third highest in residential rates and the highest in commercial rates. So how can we, on the one hand, try to approach businesses to say we are a business-friendly city, you know, when we come to them and say, but we are the highest in electrical rates when you bring your business in. You see, we deal with these problems in a very isolated way. And these things are not isolated. They're part of a system that the things that you decide or the council decides will impact what redevelopment we want to do, and it's going to impact what planning is going to do, and it's going to impact how we're going to develop economically. They're not isolated, and that's the problem. We've been looking for a place where we can all take a look at all of these indicators so that we can step back and say, are we doing things that are in, in opposition to what this other department is doing? Are we setting policies in a way that hurt a significant amount of people? And I think on that number of 20,000 residents who are hard pressed to pay their electric bill, you know, how do we address this thing on a quarterly basis? You know, how do we listen in to individuals who are clamoring, calling in and say, please give us a break or don't cut off our electricity? I think we need to humanize this process a bit and it starts with good, relevant information. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Milano. Comments on that? Um, Mr. Milano, uh, perhaps later you can provide in writing what, what particular measurements you think would be helpful. I, I must say that I think we've made some progress in personalizing information on the bills. We've given information going back 12 months showing how much uh, customers are using. Um, and I think in our, our uh, quarterly strategic updates, we have some numbers that are, are relevant to customer service. But uh, no doubt there's always opportunities to improve. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank the lady who spoke previously. Uh, Stephanie Shoes is your name. Uh, uh, thank you for showing all this creativity and effort on behalf of the, uh, the community. It, yes, and I'd also thank um, Ms. Hughes for coming here and speaking to um, help us find creative ways to save water. And also uh, to add to Mr. Milano's point that Glendale is not doing enough. I think because of the Glendale Care Program that was launched this summer, I think Glendale is becoming more um, humanized, as you call it, to help customers in need. They are getting a, a program that will provide a um, $10 bill discount to customers who really need it. And so I applaud GWP and the staff for creating such a program to help those customers, especially these t during these times. Anything else? Next item, please. Item five, old business. Any old business? Next item. Number six, new business. Any new business? I'd be curious to hear if there is any discussion in SCAPA regarding uh, the, uh, talking to leaders in the Myler Bloom industry on what can be done on that. Thank you. Anything else? Yes, I, um, I, I do have a question. Um, I know earlier we talked about um, increasing the uh, renewables to 33%, and I know we have a plan in place. Um, can you uh, refresh our memory as to what the game plan is, in what areas? are we um, going to be focusing on in order to reach 33%? As I mentioned earlier, we were at about 23%, and depending upon how you measure it, that's a, that's a plus or a minus, but let's say we're at, uh, let, we'll use 20% as kind of a round number, uh, and we, we are targeted to reach uh, 33% by the year 2020. Currently, our portfolio of renewables is comprised of wind, hydro, landfill gas, 
a little bit of uh, um, geothermal. We are about maxed out right now on wind, quite frankly. So our focus is now turning to two areas specifically. One is additional geothermal, and there's a, uh, a significant advantage to geothermal in that it's it's considered base load. In other words, it runs all the time, whereas wind and and, um, and uh, solar are intermittent. Uh, so we are changing our focus somewhat away from wind, more towards geothermal and solar. So over the course of the next 10 years, uh, much of our uh, of our new project work will be focused in those areas and other areas that will obviously be developed mm -hmm. during that 10-year period. Uh, we fully expect uh, to meet the 33% RPS by that year, most likely before that. Uh, if Steve Linz were here, he could bring you up to date a little bit on some of the more innovative things we've more recently done. Uh, I think he mentioned this at our last meeting. I could be wrong, but we've just uh, uh, signed agreements with uh, Los Angeles on two wind projects that allow Los Angeles to take advantage of the full output for the next three years, uh, and then we take back our piece at the end of that three-year period or any time before. It allows Los Angeles to boost up its renewable portfolio in the short term and allows us to lock in lower costs today and then be able to bring that back uh, years hence. So we're doing a, a number of innovative type of uh, projects now, but overall that's our focus. Great, thank you. Next item, please. Item 7, Agenda Forecast. Well, I have one item, um, since we mentioned earlier about the smart grid grants. I would be interested in hearing more about our plan for springtime when we actually replace these water and electric meters. Can we get an update on those type of replacement in the future for next month's meeting? Some kind of um, presentation on what these meters look like, oh, sure. uh, what the schedule looks like. Are we going to do it all in one year or is it going to be phased out? So just a, a status report on what this grant means and how we're going to implement it with on smart meters next year. Yes, we can do that. Anything else? Nothing else? Next item. Adjournment. Do we have a motion to adjourn? I make a motion that the uh, commission adjourn the meeting. I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. And the next GWP commission meeting is on Monday, December 7, 2009. Thank you.